You see, nothing is great until a life is changed. You do understand that. So you, you can have a good conference. You can't have a great conference. Great is only what they do with it after the conference. You can have a good book, but the, but the book becomes great when it changes the life. And, and so many times we count our victories before we have victories. We count our victories because we just looked good when we walked across the stage. And everybody clapped and everybody was happy and we thought, oh my gosh, what a good conference. There's, every, everything escalates and gets better when the people get better. And if the people don't get better, it wasn't that good. And if the people don't change, if the people don't grow, and if the people, if the people just aren't reproducing, it, it never becomes great. See, leaders understand greatness is, begins with them and what they teach and inspire their people to be and do. But the result of greatness is in the proof of the people. It's in the people. So if you say, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a great leader. Well, how many great leaders have you reproduced? So you're not a great leader because you have followers. You're a great leader because you've reproduced leaders. And so this is going to be a huge day. You're, I, I'm promising you're going to fill pages of notes, not just a page or two. That's, I don't know who does that, but you're going to fill pages of notes. You're, 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 going, to have to, <clears throat> you're going to have to go straight from here to a, a massage therapist. <laughs> you're going to say, just work the hand, work the hand. We just, just work the hand. Been, I've, I've, I've been taking a lot of notes because one of the things we do in the John Maxwell Company, it's, it's a reputation of mine to give you more than you can handle. You with me? Do you ever go to hear somebody speak and you just kind of sit there for a while and kind of hope for a miracle? <laughs> you know what I mean? You just say, I know it's, it, it, I, it will sometime get better. And you know, and, and, and have you ever kind of sometimes kind of want to just walk up and say, you know what, you're not very good. Let me give you a couple of thoughts here. <laughs> just say these, it'll help you. It'll take you to a new level, huh? Now, the reason I say that is, is, um, we work very hard. You're here by invitation. I mean, we do these things quite a bit. We've got to pack this thing out many, many times. But we just said, no, just we want the right people in the room. And we want the right people in the room because then it reproduces itself. So I've worked hard. Uh, I'm going to do the laws of growth. I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, how many of you have the, the book, 15 Laws of Growth? Raise your hand. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. That's very good. You notice I didn't ask how many of you had read it? I'm delighted today to talk to you about some of the laws of leadership. And the first one I want to talk to you about is truly the first one I should talk to you about. Now, there are 15 of them, but you have to understand there's one that I think is foundational for the other 14. Not more important, but foundational, and that's the law of intentionality. And that's where we're going to begin today. The law of intentionality just basically says growth is the only guarantee that tomorrow is going to get better. Oh, isn't that good? <laughs> if you're going to grow and, and if I'm going to grow, we're, we're going to grow intentionally. Now, I, I'm talking to leaders today. I love talking to, to people that lead many people. And to be honest with you, if, if I could just literally come off the stage and, 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 and I could get real close to you and we could have kind of like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. There are two questions that I would ask you and the two questions I'm about to ask you will really determine how successful you're going to be in this business without any question. These are the two questions. It's not like there's three or there's four or there's seven. There's two. Okay. Just trust me on this. I'm an old man. I know this. I've been around the block a few times. And there are two questions that if you can answer in a positive way about yourself, you're going to be very successful. And if you really cannot answer that in a positive way, to be honest with you, you're not going to be near as successful as you would like to be. The first question is very simple. What are you doing to develop yourself? And if you'd say, "Boy, gosh, John, I'll tell you right now, I'm doing a lot to develop myself. I, I mean, I've got a personal growth plan and, and I'm intentional in this and I'm, I'm doing this on a daily deal. If you could say that to me, then I'd say, hey, we're, we're in good shape here. We're, we're in good shape because that's the key. You know, what are, what are you doing to develop yourself? And, and by the way, 
The reason that's first is not because you want to be selfish. It's kind of like almost a selfish question. person says, well, why do I start with myself? The reason you start with yourself is because you cannot give what you do not have. So you better start with yourself. Because if you're leading others and have nothing to give them, nothing to share with them, nothing to teach them, then I can promise you, you'll never be what you want to be as a leader. And I can promise you that after 40 years of personal growth, the secret of any success, if I've had any success at all, the secret of that success has been personal growth in my life. And, and growth has, has literally placed me where I am. So, so what are you doing to develop yourself? It's a huge question. And the 15, laws of, uh, of the 15 laws of personal growth, basically these laws are all about developing yourself and developing the second question, what are you doing to develop others? You, you see, on the first question, you're foundational for your future. The second question is all about compounding multiplication that's where you build a huge business when you know how to develop other people and what we have to understand about the law of intentionality is that you cannot develop yourself and you cannot develop your people unless you're intentional and i discovered that in my 20s when i sat down and had breakfast with a guy named kirk campmeyer at the holiday Inn in lancaster ohio and he asked me the question john do you have do you have a plan for personal growth in your life didn't have a plan. Didn't know I was supposed to have a plan. Nobody ever told me I was supposed to have a plan. I graduated. I was working hard, doing my very best to reach my potential. But nobody ever walked in my life until Kirk Kantmeyer did and said, John, do you have a plan for personal growth in your life? And I didn't have one. I was embarrassed. I thought back then I had to have answers. And so I acted as if I did. And that didn't really work very long. I was kind of like a plane circling the airfield trying to come in for a landing. Found I just shut up and landed that plane. And he looked at me, and I'll never forget, he said, you don't have a plan, do you? And I said, no, I don't have a plan. And then he said to me, John, growth is not automatic. If you're going to have to grow, you're going to have to grow on purpose. That day, my life was changed. What, what Kurt was saying is, if you're going to grow, you have to be intentional. I mean, it, 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 start, it starts with me. So, so look at the person you're seated beside and just say to them, this will, this will kind of be like a get acquainted time with him. Just look at him and say, you really need to improve. Go ahead and tell me that, right? <laughs> you really need to <laughs> now, now, wasn't that fun? Wasn't that fun? Isn't it, isn't it fun just look at somebody and say, you know what, you really need to improve. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just, it just rolls naturally off the tongue. <laughs> now look right back at him and say, I need to improve. Now you said that with a lot less enthusiasm. <laughs> I mean, did you hear that? I mean, when I said, tell the other person, you need to I mean, it was loud. You need to improve. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need to improve. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I need to improve. Now... <laughs> The problem is we have what I call growth gaps. The reason that we're not intentional in our growing is there are just some gaps that, that keep us from, from getting to where we need to go. And I'm going to give you about a half a dozen of them really quickly. The, the first one is, is the assumption gap. And the assumption gap just basically says, or is I assume that I'll grow automatically. You see, most people, they live by assumption. 99% of people today are assuming, just assuming, that somehow they'll get better. Very sad, folks. Very sad. Because let me tell you something about assumption. Assumption is a huge disappointment in life. You show me a person that assumes, and I'll show you a person that almost daily is disappointed. So the, the first gap is a gap that leaves many people short. And that's just the pure assumption gap. The second one is, is the knowledge gap. And, and the knowledge gap is, is basically, I, I don't know how to grow. It, and we've all been there. In other words, okay, I know that I need to be intentional in my growth, but I really don't, I really don't know how to grow. I, I've been there. 
Now, I, I brought something with me today that's very special. It, it's a kit, and, and I, I, I'm just so pleased to have this because this kit is very important to me. Now, now it, it, it cost me $799, and I, and I got this kit. I got this kit back. I got this kit back in 19, in the 1970s, okay? And, and, and this was my first personal growth kit. It's, uh, uh, you know, Dynamics of Personal Goal Setting um, by Paul Meyer, Personal Success Planner. And, and I was so excited. It cost $799. I, now, you have to understand, I made about $800 a month. So get the picture. It took me six months to buy this kit. I, I saved up. We didn't have credit cards back then, and I just, I just saved up and, and worked hard, and it took me six months before I had enough cash to, to buy this kit. And I was, so, I was so excited when I got it, and, uh, uh, and, and I mean, I opened it all up, and it, this is just amazing. I just, it had, I mean, you'll just see some things here that just crack you up. It had, for some of you young people, you've never seen this before. They're called cassette tapes. <laughs> and I remember taking the first cassette tape out, put it on my little cassette player, opening this up. Oh my gosh, this was so wonderful. That wasn't. <laughs> they had, I mean, they had page by page plans this and I mean I, I, I go through the plans and listen to the tapes and go through the plans listen to the tape go to the plans listen to the tape this is my first growth experience and the ROI on this $799 can it's worth millions of dollars to me yeah you heard me right Millions of dollars and experiences and a lifetime of growth. And what's interesting is, now here's what I want you to hear. The value of this kit, the content was good, but that wasn't the value. The content was good. But, but as I look back now, I say, what made this so special? What made this so special is very simple. This is the kit that got me started. Hear me out. The value of what you do for people is not so much what you give to them as much as it challenges them to get started. Getting started is absolutely the key to life. And, and by the time I finished going through this personal growth kit, by the time that was all finished, I, I, I had six months of day in, day out, personal growth. And what it did is it developed a habit in my life. And, and by the time I, I finished with that kit, now I, I'm, used to, I'm used to spending time every day in, in personal growth. It, it got me started. I mean, this is, this is worth this whole lesson if you can just get this. The reason I'm so passionate about personal growth is personal growth keeps me prepared. In, in other words... If I'm continually growing, I'm continually developing myself, and I'm continually learning, and I'm continually doing new things and, and going to a, another step higher, can I tell you what that is? That, that constant growth is the preparation for the opportunity. So when the opportunity comes, it's, I, 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 here's the way. You don't go into an opportunity. You grow into an opportunity. And so I'm passionate about personal growth because for that person who says, wow, I, I, I had an opportunity. I wasn't ready. If you're growing, you're always ready. Because after I intentionally started growing, I made a commitment to grow as a leader. I started writing. I became an author. I developed growth resources for other people. I founded my first company. I began training conferences. Everything I can think of that has ever been good in my life was a result of the fact that I started personal growth in my life. I know, I know I'm known for leadership. I understand that. But my passion in life, more than anything else, is personal growth. Because if, if you grow personally, you can be a great leader. You, but if you don't grow personally, you can't be a good leader. Everything in life, everything in life that you're ever going to want 
is based upon your ability to develop yourself. So Kirk Kampmeyer said, John, um, you, you, you've, you can't just accidentally grow. You've got to grow on purpose. And so I started. And I got to thinking yesterday when I was getting ready to kind of my last preparation for this lesson, I, 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 I got started. And guess what? When I got started, let me tell you what I didn't have. I didn't have experience. I didn't have knowledge. I did not have a model. I did not have a mentor. I did not have a plan. I did not have a fellow traveler. I did not have resources. I did not have money. I did not have a growth environment. But I got started. You don't stop or not start because of what you don't have. You don't start because you don't realize yet that the fruit of everything good in life begins with a challenge. There's nothing easy in life, worthwhile in life. Everything is a pill that's worthwhile. And, and, and there's, it's not going to come to you, and it's not going to fall in your lap. It's always going to be difficult. So how do we go from growth doesn't just happen to making growth happen? Now, here's the practice, and, and you just don't want to miss this, because I'm going, to, I'm going to give you some stuff right now. This is pure gold, okay? This is so good, I hardly want to give it to you. <laughs> and the reason I hardly want to give it to you is because it's so good, I don't want you to misuse it. So, so look at the person you're sitting beside and, and j just say, take notes and don't mess up. Just tell them that. Just take notes and don't mess up, okay? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an intentional growth plan right now. It's, it's just so simple. Let's go. Okay, here's, here's my intentional growth plan. Number one, number one, make a commitment to intentionally grow. That, that's, that's where it starts. You, you say, well, John, that, that seems really simple. Make a commitment to intentionally grow. Guess what? It's really simple. But can I tell you something? When Kirk Kampmeyer looked across that breakfast table and told me that if I was going to grow, I was going to have to grow on purpose. And I looked at him and I said, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to start growing on purpose. Something happened within me. Something happened within me that just changed my life. It, it was just a, a simple commitment. Nothing that I thought at that time was going to change my life, but it was just a simple commitment. I, I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow intentionally. And I, I, it starts there. I want every one of you, I want every one of you for yourself, for the people that you lead, make that commitment to intentionally grow. Number two, make that commitment public. A commitment that is not public is worthless. Because let me tell you something. We all have a tendency to stray. We all have a tendency to give up. We all have a tendency to get off course. Come on. But the moment that we start making it public, I can remember, I couldn't afford that kit that I showed you. And I said, can you give me 30 minutes? And I lived where we were having our, our breakfast was close to the house. I said, I've got to show this. I've got to take this and show it to Margaret. And I said, I ran home and I, I got to the kitchen table. And I said, we can't afford this. It's $799. And, and we can't afford it. And, and so I've got to take it right back. But I just want to show you what we're going to save our money for. And, and we got it all out and got those cassettes out. And, and, and we looked at the material real quickly. And I put it back in the box. And I, and, and I, I went back there. But, but then I told my friends. I began telling my friends, guess what? I, I, I'm, I'm, I've made a commitment to personally grow. There's something beautiful about a shared commitment. A shared commitment becomes a strong commitment. Number three. Identify the areas that you want to grow personally in. Identify them. In other words, sit down and say, okay, where am I going to grow specifically? Now, let me, I'm going to help you here. When you start identifying the areas that you're going to grow in, it should be at least two and no more than five. Five's probably a little heavy, but, but it has to be at least two. You say, well, I, how about just focusing on one? Let me, let me tell you why. You want to grow in an area of choice, and you want to grow in an area of skill. So that's two. So when I'm talking about an area of choice, I'm talking about maybe your attitude. That's a choice, isn't it? So, so I want to grow in an area of choice. Maybe it's discipline. And I want to grow in an area of skill. So when, for, for me, I started off with attitude and speaking because I was, I was speaking. I was a pastor. 
I, I want to I be a better communicator. So I said, okay, speaking, that's a skill. I'm going to work on that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on, I'm going to work on my attitude. So identify what, what, what are the two areas at least that you're going to grow in. And then number four, invest one hour a day in those two areas. Every day, including Sundays. Every day, seven days, seven twenty-four, seven. Every day, be, okay. And, and when, you, when, you, when you spend that hour, I'm going to even tell you how to spend the hour. You spend the hour this way. Here's the way it works. Preparation, practice, reflection. Preparation, practice, reflection. Preparation, practice, reflection. Preparation, practice, reflection. You do it every day. Whether it's your choice or whether it's your skill. You prepare a little bit, practice a little bit, reflect a little bit. Every day. You're going to find this is just huge for your life. Now, while I was doing all of that, that preparation, practice, reflection, while I was doing all that on my speaking, I was starting to go observe communicators. And, 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 and when I would listen to somebody speak, I wouldn't listen too much about what the subject was. It really didn't matter. I asked, asked myself one question the whole time I would listen to them speak. And the question was, are they connecting with their audience? And I would write down if they were not connecting, why they were not. And if they were connecting, why they were. In about two years, I became a master in understanding how to connect with an audience. Because I studied it, and I would listen, and I would watch, and I would observe, and, and I would come away and say, they did three things that were just powerful. Okay, i got to go practice that. Okay, I Prepare, practice, re re reflect. And, and, and I would just work on that. And I, th this is the cycle that I worked, okay? Number five, invest one hour a week on reflection and writing on what you're learning. To take an hour every week and say, okay, for the last seven days, this is what I've been practicing, this is what I've been, this is what I've been pre preparing for, this is what I've been reflecting, and, 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 and start that. Now, now let, me tell you, let me tell you the secret on this. Because uh, I'm kind of now talking about writing, I'm talking about maybe journaling a little bit. Let me tell you something. Don't, don't try to journal a lot. Start with jotting. Jot before you journal. See, I jot every day. I don't journal every day, but I jot every day. Four or five words. Oh, my gosh. They're just, they're just mental kicks for me, okay? And then at the end of the week, you may have like 12 jots down. You with me? And you go get those jots, and you say, okay, now I'm going to spend 35 minutes. I'm going to start writing. What, 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 did, what did that mean to me? Just, just jot and then journal. And then number seven, it, 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 this is huge. No, I'm sorry. And then number six, share your growth with someone. Every week, find somebody that you can share your growth with. And let me, let me tell you how this works. You sit down with them, oh, I want to tell you what I'm learning. I want to tell you how I'm growing. Now, here's, here's how this works. This is beautiful. When you share your growth with someone, if they're happy, do it the next week. You with me? Oh, they happy. Okay. Well, let me share. Can I share with you now? See, so if they're happy, keep sharing. If they're not happy, start moving. Don't ever spend time with people that aren't thrilled with your progress. The friends I dropped in my early years, the friends I dropped in my early years were those people that weren't thrilled with my progress. Are you with me? They weren't thrilled at all with my progress. Those are the ones I left behind. I got some new friends. That's what you've got to do. Because let me tell you something. If you become intentional in your growth, You'll outgrow almost everybody you know. Everything I have today is because I have good people around me. Everything. You want to talk about any area of my success in my life, and what I'll do immediately is I'll give you the names of people. The names of people who are gifted better than I am, who complete me, who compliment me, who add value to me, who, who, who make a difference for me. And, and, and they do it with such consistency. They do it with such care. They do it with such kindness. They do it with such love. And they just do it, and they do it all the time. And, and, and it's humbling to me. It's humbling to me. I mean, this is a perfect example. 
When I walked out to teach you today, this is the first time I was here to teach. I mean, I, I, I did nothing. I, I didn't set up any cameras. I, 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 I didn't do anything. I, I mean, I didn't do any email. I, I didn't do anything. I didn't do any. I, they just said, John, could you get ready to teach the 15 laws? So I've been over there writing and teaching the 15, working on it, upgrading, doing everything else. But, but everything, everything that you're enjoying today outside of this teaching has been done by others. And I can tell you right now, when I die, they can put on my tombstone, a whole bunch of people made that man. Because they have. And I'm grateful. You say you'll never change your life until you change what you do daily. Yes. The secret of your success is determined by your daily agenda. I'd love to know, um, what do you do daily that helps you uh, impact lives and build your organization the way you do? What are some of your daily disciplines that are most helpful? Well, I love that question, and, and I do believe this. I, I believe that we uh, we overestimate what we can do tomorrow. Right. And I think we over-exaggerate what we did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and I think especially when you're old like me, you sit there and, you know, the good old days. So I, I don't think the good old days were always that good. You know right. what I mean? But I do think, and I, in fact, I know, we underestimate today. Mm-hmm. And it's the only moment I have. All, all I have is now. The only time I have. And, and that's why I tell people consistently, you have to live in the present. Mm-hmm. Uh, be there. Be, be present. Whatever, whatever you're doing, do it well right now. So in, in my disciplines to make the day count, uh, I, have, I have my um, spiritual disciplines. Of, of things that I do in my faith walk that I do on a, on a daily basis. I pray scripture. Uh, I have my um, uh, writing disciplines. I, I write always in the morning. In fact, one of my disciplines is that basically I don't meet with anybody uh, until noon because I'm a morning person. I get up around 4.30 in the morning. And from 4.30 to about 10.30, 11, I am cooking. I mean, that, that's when I think best. That's when I write best. And, and I learned a long time ago. Now, you may be a night person, so you might flip that. But when, whenever you're at your best mentally, physically, that's when you ought to be doing your most important things and, and, and making that really count right then. But, you know, who was it? I think Joe Frazier, the boxing champion, said that uh, when you get into the ring, it shows up if you practiced or not and if you, and if you worked out. And, 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 and what, what, what we do in secret will be revealed in public right. in, in it's only a matter of time. And, 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 and one other quick thought on this is I think – that consistency is such a an incredible asset to people that is totally underappreciated because Sorry. because you know consistency compounds i'm 73 and i can tell you right now the consistency of my life now is bringing fruit to my life that i i'm surprised and i think how is this happening but it's because of, of this continual day in, day out, day in, day out, teaching leadership to so many people. And after a while, all of a sudden, this return comes back that I would have never anticipated. So today, which we say is just today, doesn't seem so great. Several todays consistently done with the right reasons and the right priorities. One day shows up. And, hey, today, someday can, becomes what a day. Right. You know, it comes, oh, my gosh, what a day we've got here. Well, that day out there that we, you know, we graduate from college or we, we get the promotion that, you know, when somebody graduates from college, everybody's congratulating them. Well, they didn't become successful when they got their diploma. They became successful when they en- enrolled in college and they yes. came, when they studied for the test, and when they went to class. I mean, right. they're, they're, they're already successful. And I think sometimes we um, confuse Success, which is required of us on a daily basis, with recognition of success. Right. Which that doesn't happen till someplace back there. We weren't that good when we got recognized, and we weren't that bad when we did the routine stuff that we needed yeah. to do to get recognized. Yeah, I think that's so important, and I, I just kind of even want to highlight that for someone who's listening right now. Yes, success isn't when you get the promotion or the book deal or launch your company or get acknowledged or get published or whatever. Uh, success is when you're faithful today in doing the small things. And along your line of saying overestimating, underestimating, I had a mentor years ago, John, tell me that something very similar. 
but he said that you'll you'll typically overestimate what you can do in the short run. Yes. And then he said, but you'll vastly underestimate what you can do through a lifetime of no faithfulness. Question. And that's what you're talking about. The um, I like the idea of consistency compounds. It's so totally. true. I was doing a I was doing a leadership conference one time, and it was it, we were having a great day. And there were a couple thousand people there. And I was in my last break, and I was signing some books, and a kid with it who was just getting his MBA came up to me. He was so excited. He said, "Oh man, I love what." I love this. He said, I've decided I want to do what you do. And I said, well, that's great. I said, I, I said, I have a question for you. So what's that? He was so eager. I said, would you like to do what I did? Right. So you can do what I do. Uh-huh. See, see the, the issue is not I want to do what you do. Everybody wants to do what somebody that's doing something really amazing does. It, I, I tell them, forget I want to do what you do and, and go to, well, am I willing to did what you did? Right. You got to get in the did world before you can get into the do world. Yep. And, 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 and so we had a nice conversation. But I think so many times we see the success of somebody and we kind of gravitate like, oh, I want to do that, not realizing there was a whole process of mm-hmm. daily disciplines that got them there. And yep. without those, they would have never had that day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine somebody listening now, just they're, they're in the didding part. Yeah, you, know? the did, I, you got to did yeah. so you can do. Yeah. And, and so. I tell them if they don't do the did, they don't, they're in deep doo-doo. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to talk to you a minute with Maxwell today on developing yourself, growing yourself. Because really what I am is I'm in the people development business Pretty much, I walk into people's life, find out where they are, and then through serving and adding value to them, hopefully help them get better. That's what I do. I'm glad you're with me on Minute with Maxwell because in about a minute, I can give you a thought or two that would help you to develop yourself because I think most people would like to get better. In fact, if you really don't want to get better, you can just turn Minute with Maxwell off because this is what Minute with Maxwell is all about, helping you get better. What we have to understand about developing ourselves and getting better is that it doesn't take brilliance and it doesn't take a lot of time and it doesn't even take a lot of effort, but it must be intentional. That's the word I want to implant in your mind for a moment. The fact that you don't get better automatically, you only get better because you intentionally make a decision to get better. And here's my word for you today on Minute with Maxwell. Here's how this works. You have to go from being a person of good intentions to a person of good actions. That's the great separator. To develop yourself, you've got to get out of the intending world and get into the doing world. In fact, your good intentions are good intentions, but they're worthless, totally worthless. The most overrated phrase in the world is good intentions. I know all kinds of people, they have good intentions, but they never do good because they didn't act upon what they knew. So if you want to develop yourself and you want to get better, just act on what you've already expressed that you want to do. The moment you quit talking about it and start doing it, now you've got something. I had a friend named Randy one time who came to me and said, John, your talk talks and your walk talks. But your walk talks a lot louder than your talk talks. That's true. Become a person of action today. I I developed a a strategy I want to give you right now called plan ahead. (laughs) And this is how to navigate successful change. And can I tell you something? I started, I I wrote this down at 27. I followed it. I followed today. It really works. The letter P, predetermined the change that's needed. The first thing you want to do is you want to sit down and you want to predetermine what is the change that's needed in my life. Because if you're going to turn something around, change has to happen. Now, you don't want action without understanding what you're wanting. So your whole goal isn't to go in and change something. Your goal is to change something that matters, that works. So only you as a leader can predetermine what that change needs to look like. And the way you do it is basically say, this is what is. I mean, hey, Lou Holt said, I have a losing team. I want to have a winning team. What's it mean to take a losing team and make them a winning team? I asked him that process. And Lou told me, he said, John, I asked the players that were on the team that were coming back. Why do you think you lost so many games last year? 
He said, what I did is I did two things. I listened. I listened to everybody that was in that losing environment. I asked a lot of questions until I figured out what the issues were. And then he said that great statement. How does a leader that doesn't ask questions ever figure out what to do? I love that. If you're not asking questions of your people, you don't have a clue where they are. You don't have a clue what they think. And he said, I just asked questions. Arthur Blank, when he bought the Atlanta Falcons, told me the very same thing. He said, John, I just went out on the street and I just asked the fans, tell me, why don't you go to the Falcons games? And they said, because they stink. They're not any good. Prices are too high. Food costs too much. He said, I just got all those lists. And he said, what, see, here's, what, here's, what, here's what these leaders know. The answers to the questions you ask will be the strategy that you implement to make the change. The, the strategy is within the people, but nobody's extracted it out of them. So you got to predetermine. You got to predetermine the change that is needed, and I think you do that by finding out where the people are, asking the question. After a while, you got it. It, it begins. The picture begins to be clear. The letter A, lay out your steps. Now, I've got to lay out my steps to bring people through successful change. If I walk close to the people through this change, I'll be their leader. If I walk far ahead of the people in this change, I'll become a martyr. You don't want to be a martyr. The good news is if you die a martyr's death, you're always special in the hearts of people. Bad news is you're dead. <laughs> That's just not a good thing. You with me? Yes. So, so you've got to do what I call the leadership dance. This is the leadership dance. You can call me the Arthur Murray of leadership. Okay? Here, here's the leadership dance. This is the way this works. You've got to walk ahead of them so they can see where they've got to go. But you've got to be close to them. They don't be walking far ahead of them. Are you with me? Yes. Close enough so they can see. You've got to walk beside them so they can participate with you in the journey. So that you can listen. And, and you can interact. And you, you can take this journey together. They're in the seat beside you. And you've got to walk behind them so that you watch the people that you empower. And the leadership dance is doing all three of those things at the same time. You walk ahead as an example. You walk beside as a friend. You walk behind as a leader that empowers. And once you can do those three things and mix it up with the people, you're laying out your steps very well. The letter A is adjust your priorities. Very simple. Whenever you're going through change, there's no such thing as a pre-game plan that you actualize out completely. Let me tell you the difference between a manager and a leader. A manager is a person who took plan A and won't get off of it because he doesn't want it to change on him. He's got the plan out. He's got the strategy out. Don't mess with it. This is the strategy. Here. Stay right here. Let me tell you, a leader. A leader starts plan A because he knows you have to have a plan. But he, at any moment, is ready to change to plan B because he's found out a better way. If you think you get the answers on the front end, you've not led very much. Your answers come in the leadership itself, not in the front end. That's why plan A never ends up plan A. It's plan B or plan C. Why? Because you adjust and you hear and you listen and you, hey, by the way, you seize that opportunity. Remember, the great coaches are great because they make halftime adjustments. That pre-game plan at halftime has to be revisited. And you have to say, okay, what works? What doesn't work? And the changes you make have to be critical changes, not cosmetic changes. Remember this, cosmetic changes are easy to accept and implement. 
So people like cosmetic changes. They change the color. They change the number a little bit. And they just love that kind of stuff. It always kind of bugs me a little bit because I sit there and say, and? You know, where are you going with it? Where are you going? Outside, they like gray better than black. Okay. What, what else are we going to do? Okay. And, and so do, you, want to make, you want to make critical changes. You don't want to make cosmetic changes. And, and understand, understand this. As you make these changes, there's always an answer. Don't ever get into that scarcity mindset as a leader that if I go this path, there's no answer down to this path. There's always an answer. And there's usually more than one answer. That's why leadership is such a great art. Leadership is such a great art because the, we, you begin to understand that as you lead them, as you journey, you give them the best leadership. And that's why trust is essential in, in, in the people with you. That's why trust is essential so that you can make these changes as you go to get them there. Okay. And the next one is notify your key personnel. Sit down when you're going through changes, and there are two kinds of key people you need to notify. You need to notify your influencers. These are the people that they better say yes because you're not going to get it done without their yes. Their approval is essential. Are you with me? So you got to you got to notify up front the influencers, and you got to notify up front the implementers. They're the ones. Hey, they're the ones that are going to make the dream come true. So so you, you got to get the permission of the influencers for the plan to fly, but then you got to get your implementers because they're going to work the plan. So you notify key people, personnel. Then you a you allow time for acceptance. Now you you sit down with your key people and you allow them to have time to accept where you're going. Now, this is where leadership art is at its highest form, because your only gift, your only intuitive uh, intuition and timing are a result of a leadership gift or they're a result of giftedness. Whatever you're gifted in, you understand timing and intuition. If you're not gifted in it, you don't have timing or intuition going for you at all. So you're intuitive in your giftedness. Your ability to do timing is in your giftedness. So this, this allowing time for acceptance, this is, where you, this is where you begin to allow people to have the time that they need to move forward with you. And to do that, to do that, you have to, first of all, slow down. And, and I, when I say slow down, this is something I've always had a problem with. I'm dealing with one of my weaknesses now. I don't slow down well. Uh, when I see it, I'm gone. And then I realize, ooh, I got to take people with me. So I come back to get you. <laughs> but, but when I come back to get you, it's like, are you ready? And if I come back to get you and you're not ready, I got you. And, 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 and I, I'll, I'll sometimes go again. And, and I, have to, I have to really work hard on this, on this slowing down process. OK, because naturally I want to speed up. I, I don't like anything slow. There's not, I just I just, you know, I like to drive fast. Yeah, I just, you know, it's just. I have a need for speed. OK, <laughs> I have a need for speed. OK, and, and, and as a leader, what happens is you get too far out in front of your people. Does that mean? And, and so you got to slow down. Second thing to do in this allowing time is 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 you got to make sure you're clear in your communication. Because when they don't understand, people cannot follow what they do not understand. And so all communicators understand the value of clarity on the front end. So I travel a lot, and I brought this with me because I just love it. When you travel, you just find some funny things that are written. And these are signs in English from various parts of the world. For example, a dry cleaners in Bangkok. I love this. Drop your trousers here for the very best results. <laughs> so a bunch of people in front of that dry cleaners moon in the rest of the people. Hotel brochure in Italy. This hotel is renowned for its peace and solitude. In fact, crowds from all over the world flock here to enjoy its solitude. <laughs> this is from a Tokyo hotel. It is forbidden to steal hotel towels. 
please. If you're not a person to do such a thing, then please do not read this. <laughs> In Bucharest Hotel Lobby, the lift is being fixed for the next day. During that time, we regret that you will be unbearable. <laughs> Hotel in Athens, visitors are expected to complain at the office between the hours of 9 and 11 o'clock daily. <laughs> Is it complaining time yet? Is it? In a Rome laundry, ladies, leave your clothes here and spend the afternoon having a good time. <laughs> Outside a Hong Kong tailor shop, ladies, may have a fit upstairs. <laughs> In a Rhodes tailor shop, order your summer suit. Because it's a big rush, we will execute customers in strict rotation. <laughs> Bang! Next! Next! In Copenhagen, an airline ticket office, we take your bags and send them in all directions. <laughs> it's our gift. We'll just send them anywhere they are possibly. Make your communication clear. Uh, head into action. The H is head into action. Get going. Just, just start going. You never know the level of commitment from your people until you ask for action. You know, you, you just never know how committed they are. The letter E, expect problems. Expect them. Why? Because motion causes friction. You start moving. And it's a tremendous leadership mistake to think that you have such a plan that is problem-free. <laughs> okay? And that everybody will buy in. So what leaders need to do, here, I mean, this, is a, this is so beautiful. It's so negative, but it's so good. When I say expect problems this whole process, here, here's what you got to do as a leader. You got to think the worst first. You got to think the worst before anyone else. You got to speak the worst first. And you got to answer the worst first. You got to do all three of those things. In other words, you got to think what problems are going to be there. And then when you figure out what problems are going to be there, you say, now as we do this, we're, there are a whole bunch of problems we're going to encounter. When you speak it up to the people, they'll say, oh my gosh, he's already figured out that we got, hey, and let me tell you, when those problems occur, let me tell you what we're going to do. When you can do that well, understand you're really helping them with positive change. And the next one is always point to your successes. Somebody said, why? I said, because you always have people point to your failures. I mean, some people, that's their spiritual gift. You understand. If they can't find criticism. They're just not very comfortable. And then daily review your progress. Daily review your progress. Why? Because things get off on a daily basis. Things get off course on a daily basis. Things, problems occur on a daily basis. And I, and I close this section of creating positive change, which is the acid test of leader. I, I close this because in the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership, I have what I call the law of buy-in. And the law of buy-in, I think, answers this whole process of, of creating positive change within an organization. The law of buy-in just simply says people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. And so what I want you to understand is when, when people say, can I create positive change within the organization? Can I do a U-turn? Can I turn this around? The question is very simple. How much have the people bought into you? If they bought into you, you can turn it around. Just think as I close of the story I gave you of Lou Holtz that turned six university programs around, losing programs within two years, had him in, in college bowls. Think of what happened about the fifth college he went to with a reputation of a turnaround U-turn leader. Can you imagine just the excitement and the momentum uh, of Lou Holtz coming to our college? You know, we, we've been, we, we just stink. And he's going to come here, and, and he's, going to, he's going to turn us into winners. Okay. Now, now, let me tell you something. It's a phenomenal thing when you have your reputation that you're a problem solver, and it's a phenomenal thing when you have a reputation that you turn things going the wrong way around, and you make them positive. Once you get that, this is a leadership edge that you have. It's a leadership edge. It gives you, it gives you a sense of momentum. It gives you a sense of moral authority that allows you to come back into a situation and where now here's what I learned a long time ago when people believe the best in you as a leader they give their best to you as a leader 
So you want to become good at this session because this is the area that, that once you can do it and you can do it well, you kind of get a, a, a reputation as a, a turnaround artist, a U-turn leader that creates positive change, and then all kind of very good and exciting things happen. Yep. Now, you and I, we're very passionate about this. It's, a, it's the world of which we've, we've grown up in. But let's transition now from personally, and, and let's talk about John in the growth process talks about team growth, and he talks about others' growth that he gave us in the outline that, that we have right here. Talk a little bit about, as a leader, when it comes to leading our team and our organization, the things that you really focus on from a, a, from a growth standpoint, making sure that um, we are growing as an organization and we're not staying stagnant. Yeah. You know, back in December, we we were diligently setting our our budgets and our business plan objectives in place for here 2022. And here we are. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're folks. This. And so I'm thinking back <clears throat> right now to a conversation I had with one of our uh, P&L owners. And uh, we're talking through his vehicle of how he is planning for this year for 2022. There was no comparative analysis on his budget at this particular phase in the budgeting. And I asked him, I said, hey, hey, how did we do in this con- in, in this line last year? Well, I'm not sure, but I can get that answer for you, Mark. Well, w- w- we're, we're growing, we're projecting 28% revenue in this particular solutions group. How much of your cost, how much of your cost are you going to absorb? Is that good revenue or is it bad revenue? Right. What, what did we do last year according to revenue? Well, I'm not sure. Let me check. Here, I illustrate that without names. Very purposely. It's not you, though, Chris Goddard. You can feel good about this. I illustrate this for this reason right here to answer this question. I believe the greatest way to measure your business, now this is going to freak some of you out, is based on growth, not on goals. Mm. Because I I, want to say this because it's really important. I believe hitting a small goal is worse than missing a big goal. Now, we may unpack that if we have time because I have worked alongside people that did not agree with me, said it was an integrity issue. Well, and I've been frustrated with you in the past if we're just being candid when you come in and challenge us. And and, and yeah, it's absolutely. uh, And we'll come back to that because I want to stay on this point of how do we manage our business in the John Maxwell Enterprise. And from day one of me running this organization 11 years ago, it's been on competitive uh, comparative analysis. Comparative analysis, here's what I mean. When I get a business plan from you, Chris, or somebody else on our team, I want to know how this compares to what we did last year in this particular business objective. Even when we're spending money, when we're hiring more people, I want to know what our cost of goods sold was last year compared to what we think they're going to be this year. Why? Because it creates one of our values. This is why we're so passionate about this. This is why I have the book right here for you. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's because I believe with the value of growth, we should always be focused on growth. And John teaches goals will take care of themselves. Yeah. Again, I'm not minimizing those of us that have to work to set goals and, and, and be goal-minded. But we have learned, and I, we grew, me and you, our leadership team grew, our company from the day I took over as CEO till last year, we grew 783%. That's a big number. That's yeah. a big goal. We did that by focusing on growth. We focus on growth by comparative analysis to the same period last year, the same concept last year, the same business line. So on any, any budget, I look at the budget and I want to know, is there a number compared to budget? Is there a number compared to performance last year? And is there a percentage of growth from last year to this year or a decrease of spending this year compared to last year? It's all on comparative analysis. Now, I want to move on to point number two, um, which, by the way, we're not going to cover all four. Jake doesn't (laughs) let us cover all the content once we're in here together. But But I love this because I think you have to then communicate the priority of this to the organization. You know, the last question that you just reviewed for us that John talked about is how many people then are they equipping? Mm -hmm. So in this conversation, you're my leader. So your question to me is how many, Chris, how many people are you equipping in order to help us accomplish this, this mission, this vision we're after you said this statement. I want to share this with, with our audience. 
um, in one of our leadership team meetings, you came in and you didn't even say hello. You didn't even say, hey, how's everybody's weekend, whatever. You came in and you said, all right, here we go. You couldn't be here today. Who's sitting in your seat? Well, yep. And all of us were like, don't pick on me. And you were just like, go, who is it? Chris, who is it? Right. And so Becky, who is it? Whatever. And I was like, man, like that. Yeah, that's so good. If, if, if we were doing this in a way that we should be doing it as, as leaders of organization, we would, we would have it right there. But what you were doing was you were implementing and le- living out this, Hey, I'm going to communicate. This is a top priority for yeah. all of our people. So talk about that. Talk about the desire that you have as a CEO of the enterprise to make sure that your people and that you are continually uh, emphasizing and communicating the power um, and not only the power, but the need, because it's so critical to be developing and equipping your people. Well, it's so funny because uh, our podcast family is going to think that I'm just this cutthroat, going to kill everybody, cut everybody out, fire everybody kind of leader. I don't think I'm like that, but no, maybe, I need, maybe uh, I need to go check because let me tell not. you why I say that though, Chris. A week ago today, I'm in a meeting with two of our leaders. You were not even in the meeting. And I said, guys, who's your replacement? Hmm. And they looked at me like, what? And I said, oh, by the way, if something happens to me, who's my replacement? What are y'all going to do if something happens to me? Yeah. Now, that's kind of fatalistic, right? And it's so funny that you you just told, reminded me. I'd forgotten about that. You reminded me of a yeah. meeting several months ago yeah. where I challenged every leader. First thing I brought came into the meeting was, <laughs> hey, who's your replacement? What are you going to do? And then I just had that same conversation a week ago. I think, and I justify it with this, the law of the bench. Every leader is prepared. Surprises don't prepare leaders. It reveals leaders. I use all of these illustrations, and that was certainly my point seven days ago with these leaders. Guys, who are you training for the the unexpected? Who is your law of the bench? And I began to articulate to them what I may not have articulated in this uh, leadership meeting that you're referencing. I believe it's the responsibility of every leader to know his players and to strengthen the bench of players on the team. That's not anything earth shattering or great revealing. I'm sure to our podcast audience, what's revealing to me when you ask this question today is I told both of those leaders last week who I would replace them with if something happened to them. Now I was in this meeting, I was really challenging them because we've not moving the ball forward as quickly as I feel like that, um, we should. Mm-hmm. And I was going, guys, who is your replacement? And be inviting them into it because they probably can make you better. So it wasn't just let's find a replacement. It was who else is brainstorming with you because your replacement may have better ideas than you because you're too close to the challenge. Yeah. Love that. But as I'm listening to you ask me that question today, as I'm reminded that I asked that question again one week ago, which means I may be asking that question way too much, <laughs> I realized that while I have a plan on who would be their replacement, I have no intentionality on how I am equipping them today. Mm -hmm. So what am I going to do, Chris? Am I going to wait to equip my bench when they're actually in the game? Or am I going to equip them while they're on the bench so that if an injury happens, they're able to get right in? Your son plays football. You played football. No coach waits until the injury to equip the second string. The second string is making the first string better by learning the game plan by scrimmaging with them. In the leadership game, in mine and your company, podcast mm. listeners, are we scrimmaging enough with the, uh, the backups to make sure that they are equipped when they become a starter? Yeah. And I'm telling you this right here, I need to quit recording a podcast and go equip some people <laughs> because I've got a plan. Yeah. I just am not backing that plan up of equipping to make That's sure they're so ready good. for game day. Yeah. To further that illustration, and then I'm going to move on to the last point. You look at, now we're biased. We're in the South, so we're big SEC fans. When you look at the level of uh, schools at the highest level in the SEC, the reason they're successful is they have a bench that is ready to step in at any point in time. Yep. Injury, draft, next man up. And they talk about that, and they talk about it. So do we run our teams like that? Do we run our companies like that? I, you and I are sitting there shaking our head no together. And but I was so, doing that just for our viewers, but, not for our podcast listeners. I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't want the podcast listeners to yeah. know. <laughs> and so I love this, right? you got to be communicating this because it has to be a priority, not to, only to you as a leader. you got to 
back, you know, I'm not going to cover point four, but John lays out an incredible model. Yeah. And the first one he talks about is model it. So leaders, before you go communicating this, you need to be modeling it so that then your people understand what that looks like. And that's the first step of the five M's that John gives us. The truly born leader will always emerge, but to stay on top, natural leadership characteristics must be developed. So the question is this, how do we develop our leadership qualities and characteristics and our leadership skills? About a month and a half ago, I was thinking about this because I was in a Q&A and while I was in teaching leadership, somebody raised that question. They said, John, you talk a lot about developing leaders. Can you give me a handle? Can you just give me some things that I can really remember that will help me to do so? And off the, just off the cuff, I shared with them the, basically the outline that I'm going to give with you today with some content in between. So let's look at it. There are three, what I call the three E's of leadership development. The first is environment. I have found that leaders, leaders that are developed, are leader, they're developed because they are in some kind of a leadership environment. This is incarnational. This, this transfers leadership is almost in an incarnational or a way that this is how leadership is fleshed out. Leaders do what leaders experience. And it, when I talk about environment, I'm talking about putting an environment in a person's life that they begin to experience leadership. They, they see it around them. They feel it. And they understand it. They understand it not because they sat down and took a lesson on leadership. They understand it because they were around leaders. They understand it because leadership principles and leadership values were talked about, lived out, fleshed out, embraced. Okay? So let, let's talk about, let me define incarnation, since that's a phrase I use. It's a, really, it's a theology phrase from my background. But when, when incarnation is really connecting abstract ideas to human characteristics. In other words, it's taking something that is subjective or an abstract idea and fleshing it out until you can see it visualized in the life of a person or the characteristics of a person's behavior. And what I'm saying here is that leadership is more caught than taught. That's what the leadership environment is all about. Creating an environment where they catch leadership. Now, I grew up in a leadership environment. So I can talk a long time on what it means to have a leadership environment. And, and I can just say this. I can never think of a time when I did not realize the importance of leadership. I, I didn't have to have anybody sit down and say, you know, John, it's really important for you to learn how to lead. It's very important for you to learn leadership characteristics. I, 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 saw, them in my, I saw them in my family. I watched them fleshed out around me. You need to develop a leadership environment until leadership is not something that is extraordinary and exceptional, but leadership is something that everybody does. Because really, leadership properly understood, everybody can influence and everybody can lead within an organization. The right environment allows people who are good to get better, just like a wrong environment allows people who are good to become worse. Look at environment as the as that which helps to create something for you that enhances already what you can do and what you already do know. Now, the second E is equipping. And that's probably the one we know the very best as far as developing leaders because equipping is intentional. And basically, leaders do what leaders learn. See, in the environment, leaders do what leaders experience. Now we're going to talk about leaders really do what leaders learn. And the function of leadership is very simple. is to produce more leaders, not more followers. Now I'm going to read something to you. I just picked this up recently and I thought, this is the, this is the approach. This is the wrong approach, wrong example of how most people get in trouble in this area of equipping. Henry Ford was a genius when it came to automobiles and the methods of mass production. But I believe his understanding of the worker was too limited when he asked. Here's what Henry Ford asked. Why is it that I always get the whole person when what I really want is a pair of hands? What was he talking about? The assembly line. He was just basically saying, I don't want anybody that can think. I just want somebody that can put the part there. Just two hands. Just all I want. You know, I don't want your mind. I don't want your spirit. I don't want your soul. I don't want your will. I don't want your commitment. I don't even want your loyalty. Just... I want your two hands. 
I know most people, when they look at the people that they have in their company, their organization, this is a downfall of a lot of people. They don't understand the development of the whole person. They don't understand the big picture. They just basically see the job. And they see the job, and they said, this is what's required for the job, so what do I have to do to teach you what's required of the job? And do you have the two hands, and can't you put, those, put that in the assembly line and, and, and keep it going? Equipping begins with expectations. Let's start there. To really develop a leadership equipping organization, it begins with expectations. And, the first, and there are three I'm going to give you, and I'll give them to you kind of quickly. One, leadership determines growth. One of the first expectations you place upon people when you equip them to lead is the fact that the reason you're equipping them to lead is if they learn how to lead, it will bring growth to the organization. The second expect expectation that I, I gave them in equipping them is that leadership can be learned. Leadership can be learned. The third expectation is that each leader equips leaders. And I was always very careful to say this to them. Work your way out of your job. If you got a good job, that's great. Now, let me tell you what I want you to do. I want you to work your way out of your job. Go find somebody else. Train somebody else. Develop somebody else. Equip somebody else. And, you know, in the, in the hospital emergency room, there's a saying. And it's just a simple saying because they got to do training and equipping quick in an emergency room, okay? I mean, it's not like you, you get a lifetime for this. And, and they, they, what do they They say, watch one, do one. Teach one. You have to be very intentional in, in how you're training them and equipping them. Then the third E is exposure. How do I expose them? Which, now, now this, is, this is the inspirational side of developing leaders. Leaders do what leaders see. Okay? In fact, I love this statement. A little exposure upsets a lot of theory. I think kids should not be allowed to go to college four years in a row. I think they should go for one year to meet their friends, party. <laughs> then I think they ought to go get them a job. Because do you remember in class when you were, teachers would ask you, profs would ask you, do you have a question on what I'm teaching? Of course we didn't have a good question. We didn't have any experience. We didn't even know what good question to ask. We were just stupid kids with a textbook, filling in blanks, making profs happy. The only way you're ever going to have real questions is to go out there and try it. Be exposed to it. Now, can I tell you something? I had no questions when I was working on my Bachelor of Theology degree. I mean, I had very little, and I went through it and got pretty decent grades and graduated, the whole deal. But can I tell you, six months after I had my first church, I had a boatload of questions. <laughs> now, what happened? Exposure. Now, all of a sudden, I'm into a real world, and all of a sudden, all the stuff that I need to know that will help me to be successful in life, I don't know. So when I write, talk about exposure, expose means to make accessible to some action or influence. Expose your leaders. I want to tell you what. Expose your leaders, first of all, to great leaders. Uh, in my world, what that's meant for, oh, my goodness, 20 years, is that I've intentionally every month had what I call a learning lunch, where I sit down with somebody that's smarter than I am, faster than I am, better than I am, and I buy their lunch, and what that means is they get to eat and I don't. And I ask questions, and I just learn from them, and I just glean from them. Okay, what kind of exposure am I getting to, to great leaders? You, how do you learn leadership? How do you develop leaders? By exposing them to leaders. And, and let me one more thing, one closing thought on exposing people. Expose your leaders to the works of great leaders. Here's what I tell people. You may never have the privilege of being around all the great leaders you want to be, but I mean, can tell you right now, you can almost always get to the works of great leaders. The three E's. Environment, that's incarnational. This is what people experience. People do what, what people experience. Equipping, this is intentional, this is where we teach them, this is how they learn, and then exposure. This is something that they see, that they experience in their own life. The three E's of developing you. The first question is very simple. What are you doing to develop yourself? And if you'd say, my gosh, John, I'll tell you right now, I'm doing a lot to develop myself. I, I mean, I've got a personal growth plan, and, and I'm intentional in this, and I'm, I'm doing this on a daily deal. If you could say that to me, then I'd say, hey, we're, we're in good shape here. We're, we're in good shape, because that's the key. 
You know, what are, what are you doing to develop yourself? And, and by the way, the reason that's first is not because you want to be selfish. It's kind of like almost a selfish question. person says, well, why do I start with myself? The reason you start with yourself is because you cannot give what you do not have. So you better start with yourself. Because if you're leading others and have nothing to give them, nothing to share with them, nothing to teach them, then I can promise you, you'll never be what you want to be as a leader. And I can promise you that after 40 years of personal growth, the secret of any success, if I've had any success at all, the secret of that success has been personal growth in my life. And, and growth has, has literally placed me where I am. So, so what are you doing to develop yourself? It's a huge question. And the 15 laws of, uh, of, the 15 laws of personal growth, basically these laws are all about developing yourself and developing the second question, what are you doing to develop others? You, you see, on the first question, you're foundational for your future. The second question is all about compounding multiplication. That's where you build a huge business, when you know how to develop other people. And what we have to understand about the law of intentionality is that you cannot develop yourself and you cannot develop your people unless you're intentional. What are some of the keys to fostering the growth of leaders within your organization? First of all, I think that, Tom, I think 90% of leaders never develop leaders. I think they just have followers. Hmm. And one of the reasons is a lot of leaders don't really want other leaders. Leaders are hard to lead. I mean, it's like herding cats, you know I mean? They just don't, they just don't naturally fall in line. So, so I, I think that, first of all, most people don't really develop leaders. But, but in developing leaders, uh, you know, there are three things that are just absolutely essential. Um, you know, in the book, The Leader's, Leader's Greatest Return, I wrote The Leader's Greatest Return because I truly believe that the greatest return ever a leader ever gets is developing other leaders because that's when you really begin to compound. And I think there are three, three essentials always in developing leaders. First of all is, is your own example. Um, people do what people see. So if I'm going to develop leaders, I have to be a good leader. Maybe the greatest leadership words ever said was follow me. Just, just follow me. Watch me. Because people, what Sam Research says, 89% of what we know, we know visually. That's and, and so I, I think, first of all, in developing leaders, you have to model it. The second thing I think in developing leaders is you have to be intentional. I think that um, uh, you have to uh, commit yourself to uh, finding them, which I talk about in the book letting them come to the leadership table, uh, discerning what kind of capacity they have. A and then I think you have to intentionally have a, a, a program of development for them. I think you have to have a process. I think of all the money we spend in companies and in, in marketing and in advertising. And, and, and you know, I was, I was speaking one time, this was several years ago, for AT&T. And uh, when I got, was introduced to their maybe top 300 leaders, I was going to spend an afternoon with them. Uh, the guy said something very interesting. He said to them, he said, you're our most appreciable asset. And of course, that's a wonderful statement there. Everybody loves that. And I, and I came up behind him and I said, it's true and it's not true. I said, you're really only an appreciable asset if somebody intentionally develops you and you intentionally develop yourself. We, we don't automatically get better. And, and this is a big mess. I think that we think, well, if I just automatically go to work or if I automatically do my job, that I'll just grow. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I had a mentor when I was in my 20s just say, you know, John, growth is not automatic. You know, getting older is automatic, uh, but, but getting better isn't. And, and there's a lot, world of difference. So I think that you have to be an example. And I think you have to be incredibly intentional in saying, okay, I'm going to have a leadership culture. I'm going to, have, I'm going to, I, 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 I'm going to develop leaders. And the third thing I think that is just overlooked consistently in development leaders is that you, you, you've got to empower them. Mm -hmm. you, you have got to um, let them run the ball. Because the only way you learn leadership is by practicing leadership. So I think what a good leader does is he sets the, or she sets the stage for a successful run. You want to get some wins under their belts for mm -hmm. them. And uh, I just think that it's, uh, an empowering environment 
where you release people, and, and I, the, the problem is leaders will stop and say, well, but they don't do it as well as I do it. And I, I said, that's not the point. The only way they can ever do it as well as that you, you do it is for them to do it. Mm. And then for you to coach them and come alongside of them and, 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 and say, okay, here's how you can do that better. And you know, we have a, a kind of like a five-step equipping process. I do it, I do it, you're with me, you do it, I'm with you, you do it, and then you do it and someone else is with you. And it's a multiplication process there. So I think those three things of the example, the intentionality, and the empowerment, that's I think what develops a leadership culture that really establishes the fact that if you want to learn how to lead, this is a place where, you know, where you, where you can do that. I say this in the book, by the way, um, that when I would bring people on the team, I would share with them that I wanted them to work themselves out of a job. Yeah. And, 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 and pretty much I would just say, okay, you've got the job. I want you to do it well. Let me see you do it well. But while you're doing it well, you find somebody to replace me replace you and 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 that's how you boy that's really how you develop you talk about a, a a farm team of leaders and and if 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 you can work yourself out of your job i'll, I'll give you another job you know uh mark cole who he and i are are, are owners of the company now and he's the ceo and president but he started off in in the stock room 20 years ago Whoa. 20 years ago and i was just asking him recently in a conversation to how many jobs did you work your way out of to get where you are? He said nine, nine, wow. nine times. And I tell people, first of all, I can't promote you unless you got somebody to replace you. Mm -hmm. So the first part of promotion isn't just getting better till I want to bring you up. First part of promotion is to show me some person that we're not going to have a big loss if I do bring you up. And, you know, nine times he worked himself out of, out of a job, found somebody else and said, okay, come on up, come on up, come on up until one day. He's, he's where he is. Not bad, that's very impressive. I'll bet that you want to be successful. In fact, I will also wager that you have spent a lot of times asking yourself the question, how can I be successful? What is success? Um, how can I achieve the dreams that I have within myself? And I just want to begin this talk by congratulating you, because if those are questions you've asked, if those are thoughts that you have gone through your mind, I want you to know that you have probably within you a restlessness and a potential that says to me that you have not yet achieved your maximum success. You have not yet probably arrived to your greatest potential. And that's why we're spending time together because I have a passion, a great passion in my life to help people be successful. Uh, there's no greater joy that I have than to walk along beside somebody just like you and find out where you are and then say, okay, um, this is where you are, but this is where you could be. And you look at me and say, John, that's exactly what I want. I want to go there. I want to be there. I want to, I want to arrive that to that destination. And together we kind of, we kind of work it out and, and, and we make it. So let's talk about success. You see, the first mistake that people make about success is that they somehow think that it's a destination. So they'll come up to me and they'll say, John, um, uh, how do I become a success? Uh, how do I arrive to my dream? And, and I can tell that they look at success as something out there. They're here. And success is out there. And so somehow they think that uh, over time, I suppose, that if they do the right things, they can get there. And I, the first thing I want you to know that success is, is not a destination. It's a journey. Think of success as a process. Let me, let me illustrate it and explain it this way. Uh, if, if you go to college... Uh, you work hard and in four or five years, depending on what kind of degree you're working on, and, and in today's society, sometimes six or seven years, but, but eventually uh, you, you comes the day of graduation and you're all excited and your family is there and your friends are there and, and you're there with your classmates and you've got your cap and your gown and, and you know that there's going to be a time in that ceremony where you're going to walk across stage and the president, provost, somebody's going to shake your hand, hand you a diploma, congratulate you, and, and you're going to get off the other side. They're going to have presidents waiting for you, and they'll be taking pictures, and everybody will be shaking your hand and say, congratulations today. You've become a success. You're, you're a college graduate. Now, now, my friend, you 
did not become a success the day that you got your diploma. Now, what you did have happen to you in that ceremony is you got recognized for success. The diploma is recognition of what you have done the previous four or five years. You see, you were a success in your freshman year when you decided to not drop out of school like some of your other classmates and decided to stick to it. And you were a success every time you studied for a test. And you were a success every time you did a project or, or did a writing assignment. You see, you're a success all through, all through school. Uh, you're a success every day. Success is a daily thing, not a destination thing. The day you got the diploma, you just got recognized for the success that you already were. Now that's very essential because so many times people have a, have a tendency to devalue the moment today. What they do is they greatly value the destination. And so they kind of talk about, well, when I get there, or if I arrive there, or when I do that, or when I accomplish this, and they don't understand that success is a daily thing. And I'm here to share with you that the secret of success is determined by your daily agenda. In fact, I wrote a book a few years ago called Today Matters. I'm passionate about that book because what it does is it helps you, it helps me to understand that we make decisions and then we manage decisions. And, and too often we think, I will make a decision. For example, you're saying, I'm going to make a decision to be a coach. Or I'm going to make a decision. To, you know what? I'm going to make a decision to, to be a public speaker. I want to be a communicator. Well, congratulations. congratulations. You've made a wonderful decision. Coach, speaking, good decisions. But that won't make you a successful coach. That won't make you a successful communicator. It's not the decision that makes you. You've got to make the decision by managing it, and you manage the decision on a daily basis. In other words, what you want to be tomorrow, you've got to do today. You visualize tomorrow. That gives you hope, and that's your motivation, and that's your dream. You, nothing wrong with that. You visualize tomorrow, but you value today. What's that mean? That means that what I do every day is either getting me closer to that vision, that dream, that goal, or it's really driving me farther away from it. You see, every day we are either repairing or we're preparing. You see, if I messed up yesterday, guess what I get to do today? Fix yesterday. <laughs> In other words, if I didn't do the right thing yesterday, what I got to do today is I've got to repair. I've got to go back, make amends, backtrack, put the car in reverse, put my life in reverse. I've got to go back there. I've got to repair. Now, every day I spend repairing, I'm not spending preparing. Well, you see, we repair when we fail to manage the decisions that we've made. We prepare when we, on a daily basis, manage the decisions that we've made. So your footprints to success are really footprints of success because every step that is made and taken based upon the goals that you have for your life and you're managing those goals correctly, every step is the progressive realization of success in your life. And by the way, oh, you, you'll get the diploma, you'll get the certificate, but, but when you get that, you didn't arrive. It just is another step in preparing you to reach your potential. Each one of us should live our life as if. We'll never learn everything we never le need to learn. We'll never be able to accomplish everything we wanted to accomplish. We won't be able to experience everything we wanted to experience. We should live our life every day hungry, understanding that we are to live until we die. You see, I think success can't be summarized in a flippant degree or program or diploma or arrival. I think today 
If you are learning to coach, if you are learning to speak, if you're doing the things that are essential to the decisions and you're managing those decisions well, can I say something to you? Congratulations. You are already a success. Now, guess what? Over time, it shows up. You've heard the expression. You maybe have even said it yourself. You've heard the expression, I'm sure. I've worked all my life to become an overnight success. <laughs> That's the way it works. All of a sudden, somebody recognizes you. All of a sudden, somebody congratulates you. You didn't get good at that moment. You've been good for a long time. It just showed up someday. So, as I walk alongside of you, the reason we have tools and resources and helps and principles that we teach is because every day we want you to learn. Every day we want you to grow. Every day we want you to absorb. Every day we want you to do the things that will help you to someday be the person that you want to become. The journey is a delightful experience. The only thing better than taking the journey by yourself is to take the journey with someone else, to learn together, to grow together, to develop together, to be great together. That's what I want for you. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results 